Waylon seemed awful anxious to welcome me back from vacation tonight. <laughs> uh, what a good job he did while I was deer hunting. Uh, not just because you told me that, but you know I poked in a few times in between and heard him myself. And we're very fortunate to have Waylon to fill in when I'm not around. I hope you know that. He's better than a lot of the supply pastors we would get to come. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't just say that to uh, make him anxious to speak again, but because it's true. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be officially done with deer season and vacation and back in the pulpit. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, uh, we're going to be reading from the prophet Micah, and then from... The Gospels, um, Matthew chapter 2, if you'll stand with me, <clears throat> from the book of Micah, first of all, the prophets, chapter 5, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. When you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bow your head with me. We thank you for your word, Lord, and we pray that you may speak to us from it anew and afresh this evening. For that we'll thank you. Amen. You may be seated. High up in the hill country of Judea lies a little town that is quite historic. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania is named after it. So I suspect you know what town by now I'm talking about. Jacob's wife, Rachel, died and was buried there 
according to Genesis 35, 19. It is the town of Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and Boaz. And because of that, it is noted as being the city of David, who was the great-grandson of Ruth the Moabitess. It is the place where Joseph and Mary went to pay their taxes, according to Luke chapter 2, verse 4, which says, Into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Caesar Augustus had issued a, a decree that everyone must return to their ancestral home that year to pay new taxes that Rome was levying on the people. So since Joseph was related to King David, Bethlehem of Judea, the city of David, that little town that we sing about in the Christmas carols. That is where they journey to pay their tax. It was no accident, of course. I don't think I need to try to twist anybody's arm or convince anybody that it was an accident that it's here this evening. You know it was no accident that the baby Jesus was born there in a stable the first night that they arrived in Bethlehem. And not on the road a, a day or two before. For that is where the prophet had exactly predicted he would be born. Hundreds of years before. We read it there in Micah chapter 5 verse 2 as part of our scripture reading. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, please explain to me how that is possible to predict something like that over 500 years before it happens unless you are God. You really need to use fulfilled prophecy more in your witnessing to people. To show them that the Word of God said this is what would happen 500 years before it actually happened. Every one of you mothers here this evening know that even if the, you know a baby is coming, babies come when and where they feel like it. It was this town that those who have come to be called wise men were directed to by, of all people, Herod himself. After the Jewish scribes read this verse from Micah's prophecy, to Herod. Every time I read that and think about that in the Christmas story, I think how remarkable that is that none of the Jewish scribes even bothered to check it out for themselves. They let the wise men go do it. Even though it was right there in front of their noses in their holy scriptures. So there in Bethlehem, certainly not the same night, but sometime after he was born, possibly as long as two years after his birth, the wise men found Jesus in a house, not a stable, Matthew 2, 11 says. Bethlehem is quite a remarkable little town. It lies in what is now called or come to be known as the West Bank. What a shame it is that under pressure from former President Clinton and, and the rest of the world, the United Nations and all the New World Order crowd, under pressure Israel turned over control of Bethlehem to Yasser Arafat and the Palestinians in 1995 in hopes of a false peace, which of course never materialized never will with the Palestinians. 
And from the rooftop of the church, commemorating Jesus' birthplace, Arafat declared on Christmas Eve that year that Bethlehem had been liberated. And he assured the world's Christians that it would remain a city of peace. But it had been anything but that since the Palestinians took control over it. Matter of fact, all the, the sites that are located there, many of them have been desecrated by the Palestinians. In Bethlehem, the central personality of all of history was born. Even if December 25th is not the right day, which we don't believe it is, it is incredible that after 20 centuries have passed, we still remember the birth of the one who was born there. Amen. Think of that. There have been countless historically famous people who have lived over the last 20 centuries. But Jesus Christ, born in the little town of Bethlehem, is the only person of antiquity whose birth is still celebrated throughout the whole world. Amen. Nobody else's birthday is celebrated in the entire known world. That fact in itself surely ought to tell us something. Micah told us this in verse 2 about the one that would be born in Bethlehem. He said, his goings, have, his goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That ties him back to something that dates long before the world began. What you need to always keep clear in your mind and eye is that Jesus is not just someone that appeared on earth's stage at a particular point in earth's history some 2,000 years ago, but he was there when the stage was set. He was there when history began. That's what from everlasting means, isn't it? That means you're eternal. And if you are eternal, that means that you have to be God Himself. Because who else is eternal? Here's what the Christmas message is all about. The eternal God coming down to us, taking on a human life, so that he could grow up and die for us and be the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world in order to save us and redeem us from our sin. Perhaps none of you will, but you need to remind your friends and relatives so that they do not miss this. Because if they miss that, they will miss the whole meaning of Christmas. Well, they decorate their houses and exchange your gifts and while well, you gasp at your credit card bills come January. <laughs> Christmas is about Christ and redemption, period. Amen. All the other stuff is distraction. <clears throat> and understand, even if you remember the birth, even if you recognize and acknowledge that it was a virgin birth, you will still miss the point if you don't go on to see that this birth was for the purpose of redemption. Your very own redemption. Redemption of anybody in the world that would avail themselves of it. Micah also said in verse 2 that this one born in Bethlehem was to be ruler. A ruler in Israel. That's one of the things that threw the Jews. A ruler in Israel. The wise men came seeking the one they referred to as 
born king of the Jews. Exactly how they came to that conclusion, uh, some might debate where they got it from or how they got it, but they came seeking one that they believed was going to be born king of the Jews, Matthew 2, 2 said. And incidentally, that's the same inscription that Pilate had nailed above Jesus' cross when he had him crucified. Luke 23, 38 says that it read, This is the King of the Jews. Of course, you know how the Jews protested that, but Pilate left it there. And at this time of year, millions of people who have otherwise given little or no thought to God or Christ for the rest of the year will give lip service to that idea that 2,000 years ago, the king of the Jews was born. Indeed. Everybody but the Jews themselves acknowledge that. Look how ironic that is. Everybody but the Jews themselves acknowledged that the king of the Jews was born that night. I found it also to be very odd over the years that even many professing Christians who, who claimed to believe that Jesus was born king of the Jews, they seem to attach no literal meaning to that title. Especially anything that has to do with Jews. Jesus had founded a kingdom. And he rules in many of our hearts here this evening. But he hasn't become king of the Gentiles. And totally forgotten the Jews. Micah 5 2 is often quoted about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, and, and that's usually where people stop. But if you still have your Bibles open there, look at what verse 3 says that follows it. It says, Therefore will he give them up, meaning the Jews, until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, Who's that? That's the church. That's us. The church. Until that has, has come to pass. And then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, it says. The Lord gave up the disobedient and rebellious Jews he gave them into the hands of all the nations on the earth. And now here is this entity we call the church. And whenever the last person who is born again before the rapture comes into this group we call the church, then God will once again come back and start to deal again with the Jews. Israel will once again be brought forth. When they were brought forth, May 14th, 1948, some of you were alive and you remember that David Ben-Gurion declared Israel was an independent state. The Jews were assembled in the state of Israel, and they are assembled there now once again, still in unbelief, but unbeknown to them that they are awaiting this prophesied time that Micah talked about when they will all be converted to the Lord, and thus all Israel shall be saved according to what Paul was saying in Romans 11, 26. Have you ever asked yourself or thought about why the Jews have been the most hated people in history? And they have. There's, there's no debating that. The black man might say, oh, it's me. But no, the Jews have been the most hated group of people 
in history. Why? Well, Satan knows Old Testament prophecy much better than most Christians do. Much better. He knew that only a Messiah that had descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, only that Messiah could defeat him. So from the moment that God created the Jewish race with Abraham, all throughout the Old Testament, Satan attempted to destroy the Jews knowing that if he could destroy all of the Jews, that would prevent a Jew from being born in Bethlehem that would be the Messiah who would defeat him. You know the Old Testament history? He tried to use the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, many others to try to do it. Even King Herod killing all the male babies two years old and younger when Jesus was born. Satan did everything he could to not only to destroy the Jews, but to make certain that a Jew would not be born as Messiah. But Satan lost that round, didn't he? He lost it big time. For a Jew, by the name of Jesus, from the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was born, and he is the Messiah. Amen. So Satan has had to regroup. And now he knows, he knows the prophecies of what's ahead better than most Christians do as well. And now he knows that if he could just destroy all the Jews today, then God could not fulfill his prophecy or his promises that Christ would reign as king of the Jews on David's throne. That's what he's going to do in his second coming. You see, if he could pull that off, you see what's at stake right now with the Jewish people? If Satan could pull that off, God would be proved to be a liar. If Satan could pull that off, the Bible would be proved to be untrue. And Satan would think he would be declared the winner. God's integrity and God's eternal purposes are still linked to Israel's survival. Amen. Frederick II, who was king of Prussia at the time, once asked all his generals, can you give me one single irrefutable proof of God? And one of his generals, who was also a Christian, said, yes, your majesty, the Jews. The Jews. He said, can you give me one single, irrefutable proof of God. And that general had it right. He said, yes, your majesty, the Jews. Though they have been relentlessly pursued and persecuted, they have never been consumed completely. And they never will be. They're kind of like, remember, Moses' burning bush, it burned, but it never was consumed completely. So knowing the time was getting close, this happened in many of your lifetimes, Satan inspired an occultist by the name of Adolf Hitler to try to bring about what became known as the ultimate solution. What Satan had been trying to do for 4,000 years, the Holocaust. He succeeded in seeing that over 6 million Jews were killed 
and countless millions of everybody else too. But over six million of them were killed, many by the gas chambers. And you need to remember that and you need to talk about that once in a while because there are plenty of people today that think that never happened. That are told that no, that, that never happened. It did happen. Yet out of all that, think of this, Satan's trying to get rid of them, thinks he has the ultimate solution with Hitler, and yet out of all of that, their dream to return to Israel was fulfilled. Amen. They are there right now as we speak still in unbelief. And all who tried to keep that from happening were judged, as they always will be. Amen. I want you to look at a, a prophecy in Zechariah that you may never have heard. Or I don't know if I've ever mentioned it before or if you've ever seen it before. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 8. Zechariah 11, and I want you to turn there so you'll see it. Zechariah 11, verse 8, just like Micah prophesied where Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, Zechariah prophesied this, and notice what he says. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them. And their soul, soul also abhorred me. How many of you know that Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and FDR all died between the dates of April 14th through the 28th, 1945? Just a little over two weeks, Hitler, Mussolini, and FDR all died in the space of less than a month. Hitler and Mussolini, we know, both tried to destroy the Jews. But FDR fought them. So, how could I include him in this prophecy? What sense does that make? Well, FDR may have fought the other two in World War II, but a lot of people don't know that at the end of the war, he did everything he possibly could to try to keep Israel from becoming a nation, to keep them from returning to the land of Israel. I believe God judged him right along with Hitler and Mussolini in fulfilling that prophecy. Those three shepherds, as Zechariah calls them, all died within the period of a month, fulfilling Zechariah 12, 8 exactly. And then if you know your history, who became president when FDR died? Somebody said it. A fellow by the name of Harry Truman became president when FDR died. And Harry Truman had been taught by his grandmother to always be on the side of the Jews and always be sympathetic to the Jews. And guess what? Harry Truman was very much in favor of allowing the nation of Israel to come into existence. Had FDR lived, he would have stopped it. He would have kept it from happening. Isn't it nice to know that God is who has control Amen. over the events of history? And so, Satan didn't succeed. Hitler didn't do what Satan wanted him to do. He wanted to 
Wipe them off the face of the earth. The ultimate solution. Now this Christmas, the rapture of the church is closer than it has been in any time in history. I'm anxiously awaiting it. It will precede the second coming of Jesus by seven years. What's going to happen at Jesus' second coming? Is he going to return to America, or like the Mormons say, or Russia, or Red China? Of course not. When he returns at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, the nations of the world, once again under the influence of Satan and the Antichrist, will have Jerusalem surrounded in one final attempt to destroy the Jews forever. But what's going to happen? Jesus is going to return to Jerusalem to save the remnant of Jews that are still left there. And then the Bible says that they will believe on him whom they have pierced. As Zechariah 12, 10 prophesied. So we see all through history, Satan's plan is to get rid of the Jews so there can't be a Messiah. Get rid of them so end time prophecy can't be fulfilled. Get rid of them. Jerusalem is where the final battles will be fought. And Jesus Christ will return to Jerusalem. One of the main reasons he will return is to save that remnant of Jews that are still left. And that day, as Romans 11.26 also declares, Paul says, in that day, all Israel shall be saved. They will recognize who it was that they pierced, who it was that they missed when he was born in that stable. The king of the Jews is returning to rule and reign over literal Jews that will not be destroyed from the city of David founded over 3,000 years ago the city of Jerusalem. But it will not just be Jews, of course, that he will rule over. He's going to rule over the entire world that's left. And all the people that are left. And of course, he'll make some big changes to the landscape as well on planet Earth. So the tree huggers, they can... They can breathe a sigh of relief. It's going to come back better than it's any time that we've ever seen it. All the people that are left after the seven, the terrible seven-year tribulation period, Jesus is returning not only to save the Jews, but to rule upon the earth for a thousand years as king of the Jews. In that day, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, is indeed Lord, as Romans 14, 11 declares. And you can tell your friends, your kids, your loved ones, that if they won't bow to him now, on that day they will wish that they had. The Bible declared that a ruler who would bring redemption would be born in the little Judean town of Bethlehem. He was indeed. His name is Jesus. My hope, your hope, and the hope of the entire world for that matter was indeed placed by Joseph in that cattle's manger for a bed on that wonderful night. And knowing that is true, any that would ignore him or reject him or for any reason refuse to bow to him and serve him now 
will find out it will be the worst decision of their entire life. Don't just acknowledge that Jesus is the reason for the season. Don't miss that he really is the reason for your existence. And the reason, the only reason, that you will be able to find any hope this Christmas or any other Christmas. You know how hopeless America seems to look these days. We just seem to keep piling it on. While America and the rest of the world may look hopeless, we're the only people in the world that have any hope. Amen. Act like it. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends, real hope can be found in that little baby who's no longer a baby, who grew up, died on the cross, and who is coming again to rule the world as king of the Jews. Let's stand. Bow our heads. Oh, may God help us. Come, let us adore him, the song says. How we need to do that more and more as each day passes. Let's join together in a closing word.